I certainly think these generations have received more from the Caribbean economies and societies than any generation before. Through the women's movement, what we have seen is that it has opened up more opportunities for women. You were invited the region and then went to the small community. Well, at my area, there are a lot of problems such as unemployment, domestic violence, drug abuse. Let me first of all welcome all of you very, very warmly on a rainy day in Trinidad. You know, I really am very, very pleased on behalf of the Center for Gender and Development Studies to see so many of us to have a room so full. I want to say that the course is actually, the week is actually been um, perceived as a residential intensive weeks course rather than a workshop in the sense of it being applied learning and applied study and increasing knowledge base at the end of it. If I'm committed and if we are committed to anything and the University of the West is a good case in point, it is committed to the betterment, the improvement, the development of the region. The University of the West Indies, I think, probably has the highest commitment to regional education of any institution in this part of the world. Over the last 50 years, the, there has been, I think, greater passion, a higher intensity of effort towards achieving uh, regional reach in terms of education and also spread and depth in terms of numbers and locations and where we are not reaching students directly we collaborate with other universities like the University of Guyana and Suriname. We are looking at what CARICOM is what 14-15 countries the population we're not looking at tens of millions of people you understand? So we, as that small group of people in this basin, it's, we must develop. If you think about gender in terms of a development process that is equitable, a development process that looks at um, the fallout and seeks to address the, the, the imbalances, then as a region, if we don't all move in that direction, I mean, we, it doesn't make sense St. Augustine campus developing something without the input of the realities of F. a Dominica reality is not a Trinidad reality it's not a Guyana re reality and that is what we need even though we're small even though we're so similar we need to get a sense of look we different and I think that is where the regional space come in the voice you need that regional voice to shape the policy so for example we're trying to develop in a number of our countries national gender policies. This can't be done in a vacuum. It, may, it, it, it really has to be informed by the kind of work we have been doing in the centers in terms of our research around violence against women, around education. The Center for Gender and Development Studies is proud that it has in the space of 12 years reached to the point where it can offer the region the kind of in-house regional consultancy services that works to the benefit of people, not just there to extract from them as much as you can get, but to give as much as you can give. The area of gender requires that constant relationship between theory and practice and this course is one of those ways in which university can facilitate that. To 
be with all those and, uh, different parts of the Caribbean was very interesting because and, uh, a lot of times when policy uh, information comes from outside because we all know that the international organizations knows best what to do with policy and how to formulate them and it's very Western driven but and, uh, we, we, we want to have a more kind of a what fits us what fits the Caribbean community and we think I think we have I have noticed that we have the same kind of issues and the same kinds of good things also. I think for a long time we've been sort of working at the micro level, doing a lot of gender sensitization, training, building awareness, without taking into account enough, taking into account enough the context in which we operate. There is the tendency or the desire, the societal desire, for all of it to be one. And I think if you really think about all of our, many of our countries in the Caribbean, our sort of our motto, together we aspire, together we achieve, it's the, a lot of that oneness is part of our national ethic, our national sentiment, our national want to be. Yes? Um, and so to acknowledge within that ethic of wanting to be all one that there's significant difference is a very divisive thing. And of course in our Caribbean history we already know the divisions on the basis of, 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 um, of race. And I think that, that all of we is one ethic is meant to sort of overcome those d divisions and differences. It's, it's, it's aspirational. Uh, and so then to sort of break down that whole into its constituent parts, I think can be very threatening. But we don't really want to see the difference, especially when some of that difference is detrimental to some. We really want that sense of all of we is one. I think it's a deep, deep aspiration in Caribbean peoples. So you have two things at work, the aspiration and the reality. Those things are in contradiction and constant conflict. And within all of that, of course, to throw into the mix the deeply divisive issue of gender, of unequal power relations, because when we talk about gender, what we're, we're using that as a shorthand to say a lot of very important things. Uh, when we talk about gender, we're really trying to expose inequality in power, inequality in opportunities, inequality in which women and girls are severely disadvantaged, but also some men a severely disadvantaged and that is threatening and that's threatening to social structures, it's threatening the social status quo. I think gender analysis, gender activism, gender policy and planning and gender itself has arrived at a new place which I think we are all beginning to find ourselves in and none of us can feel secure either in our theoretical or our experiential knowledge. And together we need to find ways in which the promise of gender to developmental goals of the Caribbean are realized. We cannot do this in our little corners or in a vacuum. The relationship between the knowing and the doing must come together in ways that takes us to another more shared level of understanding of what is right and best for our societies and how as women and men we must work together to achieve these goals. Gender, basically for me, it looks at who gets what. Somebody might say that's economics, but our gender roles, who we are in our given context as men and women, determine what lives we lead, determines the quality of our lives, determines how we get resources, you know, how they are portioned to us, gender in a Caribbean context. But the thing about gender, for me, that is quite interesting is that it is not constant, it is not static, it changes. Joan Scott makes the point that the, uses of the usage of gender involves a range of theoretical positions as well as simple descriptive references to relationships between the sexes. So you have both theoretical and descriptive explanations of, of what gender means. Of importance, however, she states, is that the term gender is an attempt by feminists to stake claim to a certain definitional ground, to insist on the inadequacy of existing bodies of theory for explaining persistent inequalities between women and men. Thus, in defining the concept, she states that there is a connection between gender as an element of social relationships 
based on perceived differences between the sexes and gender as a primary way of signifying relationships of power. One of the things that this conference has made me think about is how to rethink the politics of gender. How can we retain the notion of systematic, systemic power inequalities whilst keeping alive that it's human beings we're talking about or with and that in fact we are human beings? I think we're looking at gender in a much more nuanced and critical way. I think we're getting them to another level of understanding of the issues that we need to grapple with when we talk about moving towards gender equality and social justice in the Caribbean region. Because the problem with gender is that you lose sight of the people. You lose sight of people with our everyday lives, our desires, our hopes. For me, the way through it is to think about it as feminism. Feminism, to me, refers to a political movement. My definition of feminism is a movement for women, by women, and of women. Women are crucial to understand how people live our lives and that throws light on the lives of men. Oh, what can I say? A lot has happened over the last many years and I think I don't, I don't sense that gender studies um, has that element of stridency that it might have had 10 or 15 years ago. And um, I think that that is a valuable thing because it creates a climate of greater receptivity. Um, and it creates a context in which people can argue a point of view as equals. I think we've reached a stage where we understand that gender is relational and that the situation of women is only determined by our looking at them in relation to men. And so if we really want to understand what's happening to women, we also have to understand what's happening to men. And so I think whether we like it or not, we're going to be forced to bring men on board. We have to begin to understand the issues that impact them from their positions and from their perspectives. In a Caribbean context, gender, gender roles and responsibilities are quite interesting because for Caribbean African people, the gender roles are different, and historically so, coming out of slavery, we both worked, men and women worked on the, on the slave plantation, but women had this reproductive role also. But a European Caribbean person may not have, would not have the same gender experience, the gender realities are different. It would be abstracted from a European norm. And think about it, you throw in an East Indian gender role and responsibility in the Caribbean, which is people they worked, the indentured laborers, they came, they worked together, but there's still that reproductive and productive role of men and women. That So the, to me, the Caribbean is this really interesting place where you have all these gender norms and all these gender roles in one space. And you're thinking, how do you let that function in such a way? How do you create a space that facilitates that to function effectively to produce a developed space? The beauty of the gender analysis is that it allows you to understand that society is not homogenous, that it is comprised at a primary level of women and of men, but then between amongst women there are many differences, there are differences of ethnicity, there are differences of colour in the Caribbean that matter, there are differences always of course of, of, of economics, similarly with men. Um, I think that's a very powerful epiphany when you get it. And you can understand that your population is made up of a great diversity and your obligation if you're involved in the state sector or in the NGO movement is to respond to those differences in a way that makes all people access justice. The reason for me coming here 
for this training was and uh, that I was very curious about uh, the practices that are already applied for po making policy, gender policy, and especially to have a more realistic policy because overall policies are useful for politicians, not useful or less useful for the people in the street. In our academic work, for example, we've been doing a lot of research. We have a lot of the facts. These are the people working on the ground who need to influence policy. But I think we're beginning to recognize that policy has to be evidence-based. At the end of the day, UE is accountable and I think the community reminds us that these are the people we are serving and I think we are all, we need to be always conscious of that. It is absolutely important for us to begin to work alongside and with these individuals to bring our academic work to, to influence and bear on the work that they're doing on the go. Understanding what is happening in the community allows us to make classroom life for the student much more real, much more invigorating, much more relevant. The community is not interested in policy. The community is interested in help, in dealing with the problems. And how do we make policy actually a tool for them to help them? we can make things that are in laws or if you have a policy how do you all think that we can get those things to work for you and for some of these issues in in your communities does anybody have any things that you would like to see for example There's a strong link between the gender issues and the problems that we are confronted with, chief amongst which is the issue of domestic violence. The issues of domestic violence impact on every aspect of family life. Men are abdicating their responsibilities towards their families. What about the child? Does the police take the child away from the abuse or send back that child home? What is there in place? to protect that child. If there isn't any, why, is, why there isn't any? And if there is, isn't any, how we could do something now, maybe to, to protect that child? One of um, the major problems in this community is alcoholism. Uh, every weekend, every Friday evening, Saturday, Sunday, see our youth, especially male, um, at every bar you can see. That's our fathers, our brothers, husbands, and I think that's a major problem because they use their hard-earned money to go to a bar to buy alcohol when they have their wives, children at home suffering for basic necessities such as food, clothes, and shelter. There is also the abuse of other drugs, particularly marijuana and the cocaine. It's a very big problem, but it's not seen as, easy, as easily as the alcoholism. It's not very often you see people taking the bottom-up approach. And I'm very happy this afternoon that that is the approach and that we are hearing directly from the residents so that we don't just come up with a problem, but they are actually telling us what is their problem. We have to solve the problem looking from their perspective. Where I live, we have a lot of people still don't have electricity. 
Without transportation for the children to come to school, they have to walk miles. They have single parents, don't have anybody to support them. They don't get no um, welfare. They live off a cutting cane, sometimes doing maid work and things for people. They, have, they don't have proper housing. They don't have any husband to support them. They don't have a village council, in fact, to support them in the district. And recently this year, a little girl have um, 12 years, she nearly get raped. And the only time you see police or community police, either they come in to look for somebody who, who on drugs. It have a lot of domestic violence in our district, where two parents smoking. They don't have no community leaders coming together and talking to the parents or anything like that. Where is your, what we call at home, pal reps? I mean, there are people who are supposed to be representing you at government level. And it seems to me some of the problems that come out there are basic problems, infrastructure problems, problem about electricity and things like that, that you would think that this is something you would take on with your government representative. We are saying the best planners for our community and the people who live in the community. If therefore you can get a consensus from communities and how particular regions should be planned, then that's the best way in which you can really have true and meaningful local government. That is not happening. We can't operate like that. We need to have certain policies in place that says, where is the framework? This is the framework. These are the steps in the process. We must follow those. And finally, when we talk about good governance, we talk about issues of participation, transparency, we talk about cooperation, and all those nice words. But those words have meanings, and those words must have attached to them certain guidelines. Now, we must take some time and explain what participation means, and what cooperation means, and what good government means. Unless we do that, then we use the words, but they will have no meaning. So can you give meaning to those words, please? And can we have now link that to community and then can we link community to government and then can we link that to meaningful change. Ram Nagar ke rahiya batai de Ram Nagar ke rahiya batai de Rahiya batai de Dagariya batai de Jau ne ghat more de ura nahi hai Wohi ghat more nahi ya lagai de Ram Nagar ke rahiya batai de This is how uh, non-traditional gender training was passed on to the ladies. Men actually are not allowed to be anywhere close to the matikur. It's a more vulgar dancing and uh, that is your sex education training. Um, my research was really focusing on interviewing men who had um, found themselves in the courts or in a situation where they were mandated for counseling. The focus really was um, in terms of the findings, the ways in which an adherence to traditional gender roles really contributed to their use of violence um, against their wives. The men who battered their wives battered their wives because they learned that violence was an effective means of achieving the goals that they had. They also had very traditional expectations of their wives and they often didn't see any alternative action available to them to achieve their goals, to get their wives to behave in the way that they wanted their wives to behave or to get their wives to do the things that they wanted to do or to correct or discipline their wives when they felt that the wives had done something wrong. 
so that one of the things we have to focus on is really providing alternative methods of conflict resolution and also to broaden men's expectations of their wives. They shouldn't only um, be socialized into expecting that the wife would be the good wife in the sense that she would always have hot food on the table, she would always behave within certain limits, um, she would be a good mother according to his, his particular expectations. Three months ago, I was asked to investigate a case. When I went to the home, two children were hungry. The wife was nine months pregnant. I asked her, well, what's happening? You have to go to the hospital? She said, yes. She said, but my husband told me don't bring home the child. So I said, what are you going to do? She said, I'll leave it in the hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, women face discrimination in today's world in all areas. This is my stand. Politically, economically, and socially. I really have to compliment you on the way you um, fight to get your problem solved. I like the approach. It is not an approach where you wait for the government to do something, but it is an approach by which young and I don't want to say older people, I mean everybody <laughs> is trying to solve the problems. You don't just sit and wait for people to do it. It really empowered me. It really gives me the feeling that we can do something with the limited resources we have if we want to. And another thing that I admire is the way that it is not only women who do something, also men. This is different because normally you don't find men talking about women's rights and children's rights, but this approach is really different. The feedback that I have heard from the people who were involved in the community was that they appreciated so much your participation. I think the most touching part was the the tangibles that were traded, the mutuality, they felt listened to, they felt their words had meaning, they felt understood, they felt a respect and this value that you put on the relating with them in their space confirmed for them the value of their thoughts, their words, their questions and your responses. I think that was the most significant thing. The respect was tangible. And just before we left, they brought me into the kitchen and they said, this is the dance that we couldn't do. And, and they showed what they do was they, they gather up their skirt um, just below their waist into a lump and put into it some um, maybe vegetable that might have a phallic shape. And they use this to dance very close to another woman and to do the thrusting motions to explain the sexual act. Those women actually lived that experience. Their marriages were arranged and that's how they learned about sexuality and gender. I think that one of the challenges of yesterday was hearing what people's concerns were at a very daily level. So the kinds of things that they said had to do with things that they experience in the everyday. Difficulty getting a job, dealing with relationships and having to negotiate, needing recreation in the community, and the difficulty 
of trying to convert that to something that is meaningful in the policy and then getting to see how policies have to be meaningful in an actual practical way back to those people. So I think it was enriching to hear that kind of discussion but it also highlighted that if policies don't in some way address those very daily concerns and emotional needs and the needs for partnership that in a way you wonder you know what the purpose of policies are so it was almost like the challenge was to us to to think how how can those levels be addressed and not just to hear them I wasn't able to sleep last night if I did at all and it is because of what happened after our session in San Francisco yesterday Catherine and I stood back a little bit to um, make sure everything was in place and uh, properly looked after and so. And on our way back, just about, I would say about three minutes, Catherine, after, the, um, after w where the center was, um, in the driveway of a home, we saw a man beating his wife and the child screaming. We went to the police station where well, he followed us there of course, he denied that he ever did anything to us. He said that he doesn't know us, who we are. And when we asked the wife and the child at one point in time if they wanted to go with us to the police station, the woman replied, it doesn't make sense because he has friends who, who are police officers. Well, when we went to the police station, we confirmed this. The female police officer said that his friends, he has friends who are police officers in that very same station. At the end of it, nothing happened. The man came, they said, well, he, they are accustomed with him behaving in that manner. And nothing would come out of it because the wife has to take the action. If she doesn't take the action, they will not do anything. Sometimes communities have problems and when they look around and try to find out oh, how can we begin to address this problem as a community. Um, I would like to think that the University of the West Indies is one of the places that they would look to as having solutions and answers. And I think that kind of initiative from the community could only be heartening to someone who is part of an academic community and a community of learning. If something positive happens, it is extremely valuable in terms of knowledge creation. The struggle for Caribbean people really is the struggle of, of um, commitment to the social good, to get back to community and collective action and to take responsibility for this space which is ours. Yesterday, made this workshop very meaningful for me. As a community person who was invited here, I feel that that lent some substance to this entire week session. Unless we together bring our men folk with us, because they are part of us, we are not going anywhere anyhow soon, and that domestic violence is going to continue. For me, the trip to the community was an absolutely wonderful way of making the connection between the model, which in this country has produced a very wealthy country, the economy is booming, but then where do those women fit in this economy that's booming? It doesn't recognize them. It does very little for them. They must wait for it to trickle down, by which time they're dead, right? And that happens in all our countries. Some of the people who are involved in gender studies need to enter either new disciplines or enter into discipline into areas of multidisciplinary study that can have impact on more than gender issues. It is not only about doing a gender policy but about doing gender sensitive policies. So it's if your agriculture policy, if it is your your health policy 
if it is your um, education policy, whatever policy it is, to ensure that it is gender sensitive. We as, as women leaders, because we are all in this room leaders, in our own special way, that's the quality we can bring that's different. If we take a gender approach to our work, social transformation simply means a different approach to your leadership. We're not trying to maintain the status quo here. The progress that women are making in education, for example, why aren't we seeing them in leadership positions and so on? And I am beginning to see that this is really because of the frame factors that operate in our societies. The economic systems, the political systems, and therefore we really have to begin to look at the sort of political economies of our societies. The way capitalism works, the way patriarchy works, and unless we begin to attack and address those systems, how they function on a daily basis, the productive forces, the reproductive forces, the interplay between the two, I don't think we're really going to reach to a point where we can begin to see the real empowerment of women in our Caribbean societies. So it seems to me we have to sort of start looking inwards in all sorts of ways in our economies, looking between ourselves, which is what CSME is supposed to do allow us to look inwards a little bit and to rely on each other. But we also need to have in the cultural zones to rely on each other for the progress that we need. And we can only rely on each other if there's trust and there's equity. So I think you, you really never get away from the gender equity as being a pivotal point in Caribbean development. If we don't have that, I don't see, I can't see us making the gains that are sustainable. If we don't have relationships built, up, built on trust and honesty and love, 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 between Caribbean men and Caribbean women, I don't think we will get that, that progress. One of the things I have to say in terms of the commitment of the Center for Gender and Development Studies, as it is a university department, is that it, it pulls the university into practicing what it preaches and what it is there for. A university is about people and how you look at people's lives and how you interface with that. And I wanted such a course to ensure that the university was living up to its mandate. Its mandate, which is a regional mandate, a mandate about community, a mandate about bureaucracies. And I think in that sense, pulling us all together, the, the, this is part of what the university is mandated to do and what the center itself is committed to doing.